So that brings the whole idea of this therapeutic reason to do it. So they saw an obvious trauma, an obvious fracture of the skull, and that's why they performed this. So Horsley was one of the champions of this. And in looking at all these skulls, different from the conclusions that Broca came up with, he decided that in these studies, they saw all these skulls were uh, most often accompanied by uh, trauma and the prevalence of left-sided injuries. And that's important because if you meet your opponent in battle and you're right-handed, you're going to hit him on the left side of the head. And so they surmised that if most of these are left-sided trepanations, they must have come from right-handed attacks. And Drushko, uh, in her PhD dissertation in 2007, actually did a scientific study of these findings and found that 16% of all skulls they found in this one area of Cusco showed some evidence of trepanation. 70% of males, so leading more to that trauma hypothesis, and that 44%, which was a significant amount, showed some evidence of trauma. This graph shows perimortem versus those that have healed. Perimortem meaning that they died either at the time of the trepanation or very shortly after. And we see this move towards younger patients having this perimortem death or perimortem trepanation. And to him, that meant that you know, as these were being done in younger patients, would be more likely to be the sort of warriors that were involved in these traumas, whereas the older patients are those that survived, that were allowed to live beyond that. Bindrushko also looked at this left-sided versus right-sided, and the area that I've taken out here were the right-sided injuries. Everything else was left-sided or midline. Again, moving to this right-handed attack hypothesis. So the support of this is the associated trauma, and we can see in this skull a fracture extending right to the trepanation site. The male-female ratio being more men, those would be more likely involved in some sort of battle. That overall age and perimortem distribution as we saw. And then these left-sided uh, trepanations, again, from where this right's hand of attack. Another uh, thing that they saw was in one of these skulls, there was this uh, micronathic ear, this very small ear canal. And they thought that perhaps this child had some sort of obvious uh, abnormality of the ear, and that's why they performed this trepanation in the back of the head <coughs> called trepanation supraineana. And they do find this somewhat, somewhat often in these Peruvian skulls, pointing towards the therapeutic treatment or neurosurgical therapeutic treatment comes from the oldest medical document that's ever been found, and that's the Edwin Smith papyrus from approximately 1650 BC. Um, it was actually presented to Harvey Cushing after it was translated to describe, it was, uh, it's viewed as the first description of the word brain, the first indication in any written form that there is this uh, structure in the head. And it actually listed all these different ways of treating different cranial fractures, different trauma, and how you would do that. And those fractures that could be treated, and those fractures that were considered untreatable. And so this is, again, the earliest written record of any neurosurgical treatment. Hippocrates is another uh, source that we get this idea of therapeutic treatment from. He lived in approximately 400 BC and wrote uh, a book called On Injuries of the Head, where he describes these different kinds of injuries and what you would do to treat them. And one of the treatments um, for fractures was this idea of trepanation or creating a hole. And what he would do is, based on the fracture, you make an incision in the scalp, look at the fracture, then you fill it with this thing called cataplasm, which I'll go into later. Uh, you inspect the wound. If there's just a dent in it, you just scrape out that dent. If there's actually a fracture, then he recommended trepanation. And this is from 400 BC, where they didn't really understand this, but still, this was the written recommendation. Galen, who was another Greek uh, physician, came years later and worked on that idea by Hippocrates uh, to sort of say, we'll perform these trepanations, but we're going to also include ideas of increased intracranial pressure, whether it be due to hematoma, due to abscess, hydrocephalus even, um, he was one of the first to describe hydrocephalus in the ventricular system. And so these are obvious trepanations for some sort of therapeutic reason. They used a drill such as this, um, which is called a terebra, and basically you wind it around this pole here, put it on the skull, and then allow it to spin back and creates a hole in the skull. He also described something called a meningoflax, which is a piece of metal or, or 
banged out bronze that was placed under a fracture so that when they drilled through, they wouldn't go through the dirt. Avicenna um, wrote uh, much later in approximately 1000 AD, he was a Persian physician, wrote a book called The Canon of Medicine that was actually used as the medical text through well into the 1800s. Um, where he actually further divided the brain into more functional categories and described burhole trepanation for subdurals. Another Persian physician, Albucasis, um, wrote huge volumes of medical literature, the last one uh, being partially devoted to neurosurgery. Um, and he actually developed some of these trepanation instruments to allow it to not go through the dura, these stoppers on the trephines. Um, and describes what essentially was temporal arteritis by ligating the superficial temporal artery, which was sort of interesting. This idea of neurosurgery in a thousand, uh, you know, eight hundred, a thousand years ago. So, another motivation is magico-therapeutic, meaning there's something obviously wrong with the person, but not necessarily attributed to the brain. So Broca, his idea of infantile seizures, there was nothing wrong with the child's head. But they were having these seizures, and so obviously we have to let out those evil demons. And that was his idea behind trepanation. He understood that the Incas knew the term, knew of seizures, and this was as the Spanish got to America, they spoke with the, uh, or, or understood from the Incan tribes that were there, that people did have seizures. Um, mastoiditis is another example. We see trepan skulls that have obvious examples of mastoiditis. That's something that you would not have seen externally, but would have bothered the patient internally. And then there are other diseases that they surmise that may have given rise to this trepanation. Um, it was further uh, promoted where in 1946, a missionary actually in uh, British Columbia in Canada was approached by an uh, Indian who said, had a burr in his hand and said, please drill this hole in my skull to allow these evil spirits out. And that's obviously recent, but that's sort of where this idea comes from. So magical ritual is the idea uh, that it's done for some sort of ritualistic purpose rather than anything therapeutic. So Sir Francis Galton, uh, who was actually the cousin of Charles Darwin, uh, thought that not only were genetic traits passed on through subsequent populations, but also that intelligence and ability was. And this is what this eugenicist sort of refers to, is that your ability and intelligence is passed on and believe that these prehistoric races were so ancient that there's no way they could have come up with these ideas. And that sort of goes back to that debate that we were having earlier. And because of this, they obviously couldn't have done it for any of those therapeutic reasons, so they must have just done this for ritualistic reasons. Some of the evidence for that comes from a large number of skulls found in, in this region of France. Um, in these tomb chambers where they knew these rituals took place. And so, you know, surmise that this is probably why they did it. In Yugoslavia, as you can see, uh, there is, actually was this ancient custom of when there was some sort of feud, the person could submit to a trepanation and get out of that dispute. So again, not for a therapeutic purpose. And then post-mortem. So, pieces of the skull taken afterwards, uh, and creating these amulets or rondelles of bone. The idea here is that they thought that the skull actually contained some sort of mystical healing property. And they would try to take these pieces of bone from people who survived trepanation. And actually well into the Middle Ages it was thought that ground up bone or ground up skull possessed some sort of magical property. When they find these skulls, how do they know that this was some form of ancient surgery and it's not just some other pathologic uh, finding, some other reason for a hole in the head? We here we have two examples, <coughs> two different skulls. One of them is uh, an evidence of cranial tuberculosis. The other is a trepanation. Um, so here's your tuberculosis here, here's a trepanation. And so how do you know that it wasn't just tuberculosis that this person had? How do you know that something was actually done? How about tumors? We have multiple myeloma and uh, epidermoids. This is actually an x-ray of a patient that had a trepanation. So when we find this, how do we know that this wasn't just a patient with multiple myeloma? Um, part of the answer of this comes in, we look at the rest of the body. So oftentimes these skulls are found with the intact skeletons. And if there's not multiple myeloma or these lesions in the rest of the skeleton, and just in this one area, 
and it surmised again that this was some other process. 